Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. My name is Spiros Gasteratos, and I'm here to talk to you about running a scalable AppSec program, leveraging open source and metrics. So a few things about me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm 0xfd. I work as an application security engineering lead at Thought Machine. And I've been a NOWASP volunteer for close to 10 years now, since I was uh, effectively uh, a student. And you can reach out to me on Twitter, as I said. Uh, first, let's start with a disclaimer. Uh, opinions presented here are my own. I I don't claim that anything I present is gospel or you should follow it to the letter. All the work was performed by a team. I have, I'm blessed to have an incredible team that did a lot of these things. And I would like to extend thanks to everybody mentioned in this presentation for paving the way for us to, to, to do all the good things we did. And also special thanks to my colleagues for feedback. Here's what we're gonna talk about. Um, we, were, we will try to reference OWASP SAM maturity levels for its work stream. OWASP SAM is a generic framework, so references are loosely mapped. And we're gonna talk about how we started what were our initial goals and our initial strategy, uh, some tooling we used, visibility, training, vulnerability management, and in the end, some takeaways. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, I joined this company about three years ago. And at the beginning, they had um, CICD, some common libraries. They were using security user stories that were vaguely inspired by ASBS. They loosely followed some uh, OWASP SAM because OWASP SAM has some pretty common sense advice. For example, deploy everything via continuous integration, continuous development. Uh, however, they had probably one of the most solid build systems I've seen to date. It's called Please. It's open source and it's really great. The company was small, about 90 people. They were writing in four languages, Go, Java, Python, and TypeScript. And they were writing microservices on managed Kubernetes. And they were also using linters. And they had pretty solid secrets management. So for example, no secrets in code base. And they were doing opportunistic pen test. The security team was two very senior people uh, with incredible skills. And understandably, because of the size of the company, the maturity was kind of all over the place. There were parts of some secure build maturity too, but requirements driven testing was level one, opportunistic. There was security testing level one. Someone was running some SaaS tools in you know Jenkins opportunistically, and there was some pen testing, but there wasn't anything that was on purpose and solid. So first thing we did, we sat down and we set some goals. We were emphasized uh, we are in growth mode as a company, so our, anything we do needs to be scalable. We wanted more visibility so that we need to know who is doing what. We need better detection. Where are the skeletons in the company closet and what products did we rush? We needed better automation because CPU time is very cheap while engineering time isn't. We wanted fewer defects found by customers because every customer call had to do about defects. It's time we, we, we could use towards building things. We wanted to measure everything so we know what we're doing. And these were the initial goals, which kind of made sense. So how did we start? We started with detection. We wanted to improve how we detect things. So we approached vendors trying to see what's out there and what can we use. And we leveraged our build system to run SaaS tools on parts of the code base. Furthermore, while vendors, while vendor engagements were underway, we started dockerizing popular uh, SaaS tools 
like Bandit, GoSec, find some bugs, and then some composition analysis like pip safety and dependency check. And we used a similar model, model to GitHub uh, pipelines or GitLab uh, pipelines to run these tools as part of our CI CD. And automate, automatically, we ignored very noisy rules. And at the end of this, we did an in house pen test. The idea was to leverage all this tooling to find weak code bases and teams without a lot of security knowledge so we know what to prioritize and what to focus. To do this, this is a handy gun chart. It took us about a week to integrate all the tools, then a month and a half to get meaningful and consistent results across the whole code base. We had other tasks to do, and that was our first month. We revisited our detection after the first quarter, and we continued detection modified as part of BAU to this day. What did we measure? We measured through findings per team, so signal to noise ratio pretty much per team, which gave us a basic idea on the team's maturity. We measured non-reproducible findings per team, which gave us an idea of which teams are um, either too cocky and they try to do arcane things instead of doing things the suggested way, or teams that are that know what they're doing, that are better off. And we also measure code, ba code bases with significantly fewer th findings than average, which means that we don't have a lot of visibility and we needed to do manual uh, testing or write better rules. It took about a day to figure out if a sample of low signal code bases are due to exceptional or uninteresting code or due to missing rules. So we had, after that, we had a basic idea of what's going on. After we measured, we did a small retrospective. We felt that we spent way too much time talk to, talking to security detector, uh, vendors. Most vendors need uh, a lot of lead time before they're useful. And at the beginning, we needed results very quickly. And we also needed to continuously evaluate our setup. So we didn't have a lot of time for vendors. But and also the noisy rules we turned off had a small number of true positives that we missed and we found other ways later. However, all this effort uh, brought us to some security testing level two employee application specific security testing automation and conduct manual penetration testing, which we did. Now, after the first couple of weeks running detection and remediation, we started getting approached by engineering teams with questions about their designs. So we started adding alerts. What alerts did we add? We wanted to know what's going on. So alerts for new features planned, and we book time in our calendars to review the new features planned and guess if input is required. For example, additions to a payment system is much better than, like much more important than new information on a static front end page. As a byproduct, we got really familiar with the company and who's building what. Now, this improved our security requirements section of some. It didn't give us level two, but it gave us, let's say, 1.7. This alert was a very quick win. Uh, implementation took no time at all. And we revisited this after two releases. At the time, we were doing monthly releases, so after two months. Now, the next part was measuring what we did. What did we measure? We measured correct guess frequency versus overall features and how many meetings we had with teams to give them security input and how many of these meetings resulted in new requirements. They, both of them were, could be taken from our calendars and calendar invites, which was great. Initially, our, me our measurements were really bad. We missed a ton of important features. However, this matured massively with threat models, which is coming up. So next thing was threat models, visibility level one. 
what did we do? We set up security champions, and the goal was to have contacts for security, general security champion things, but also threat modeling. So at the beginning, we approached team leads and we told them that from now on, they are security champions and they need to do things. And if they don't have time, they can delegate to their team. We hold, we held uh, threat modeling meetings, uh, taking threat modeling advice from Microsoft and OWASP. And we had a 30 minute meeting, which was once a week with all security champions to share updates. So we continue having more visibility. As a bonus, we set up open presentations called brown bags about threat models or internal findings we had or industry news. There are very popular resources out there, uh, both a playbook and a presentation on how to do these things. I think that brought us to some education level one and a bit and uh, OWASP some threat assessment level one. The MVP for this work stream, which was initial threat models for its microservice, plus how we expect the system to be used, took about two months to be of acceptable quality. We measured and improved three months or three releases after threat models were deemed to be of acceptable quality. What did we measure? We measured the team understanding of the system, pretty much presentation quality on the brown bags. We measured how many members from other teams participate in our brown bags, and we measured threat model service coverage and depth plus champion participation. Participation was kind of verbal, uh, verbal retrospective, let's say. So what did we improve? We use the feedback during presentations to improve threat models and threat model quality. Uh, the meeting became too large. It had a, a 30 minute meeting with 10 engineers is too expensive. So it was transitioned to being a questionnaire. Uh, we reserved the live meeting for significant changes or if somebody needed to really bring something to our attention. And after we had good threat models and the security champions knew how to threat model, we transition the responsibility to the champions and the teams. I think that brings us to some threat assessment level two. It says understand the risks for all applications to the organization by centralizing the risk profile inventory for stakeholders and standardized threat modeling training processes and tools to scale across the organization. And I think we reached about that level. However, no matter how much threat modeling and how many security champion things you do, you need you still need training. So we try to improve the training we were giving. We adopt adapted it to be coding focused. We added the spot the bug game for internal technology, and we offered the menu of services offered by security something like talk to us for threat modeling advice or any consulting we did or pen testing, things like that. The important thing is that we put emphasis on everybody messes up and there is no blame. You can talk to us about anything you found. You're not going to get fired or you're not going to get punished. It's better if we all find it. And we made it mandatory for new engineering joiners and optional for everyone else. I think this brings us to some education level one plus. Uh, level two means says offer technology and role specific guidance, including security nuances of its language and platform. It wasn't exhaustive for its language, but it had generic nuances for most of our main languages, which is important. So one plus. Now modifying the existing training and creating the new one took us maybe a couple of days on and off and then we measure measured after each iteration but we did the retro after five to six iterations what did we measure we measured voluntary participation in the training we measured engagement while on the training we measured follow-up questions we measured interaction frequency with security champions, pre-training and post-training, and upsetting velocity loss. 
The team velocity loss was minimal. An hour and a half every two weeks is not really terrible. Interaction with champions improved for the champions that took the training. Teams that kept their tech lead as a champion or appointed the senior engineer or generally somebody without a lot of time where it was kind of a mixed bag. Some senior people were very much on it. Some were very silent and so this has another responsibility. People who followed up was was also people who engaged during the training. And obviously engagement was kind of all over the place as it is with engagement. Most people, like some people were really happy to be quiet. Others had a lot of questions. What did we improve? We adapted the slides often. We gathered feedback almost every after, uh, almost after every training, if not after every single one. We added recent findings, we improved examples, and we improved our menu of services offered as we created more tooling and more services. However, at that point, we were doing training, we were doing champions, more threat models, and we were doing a lot of uh, SAST and DAST um, scanning and pen testing. And gathering and triaging SAST results was by far this, our slowest activity. Running tools on and having to triage every single finding, every single time, and then copying the results to a ticketing system is not great. And also burn, with these tools, burnout increases linearly with more tools you add. Because every new tool, even with your own rules, increases the time you need to triage. So we got inspired by a bunch of people and we created a framework of our own, which can take results from several tools and put them in several sinks, in several places, while the duplicating and managing false positives. Uh, we, mean, we named it Dracon. It's a, it, it, does, it does what I said, uh, aggregates kind of results and marks them once as false positive. Dracon was a very long running project. It took us three months to make it. Then we stopped for a bunch of manual pen testing and other activities. Then we started again for a month and we measured two months after we released the thing. What did we measure? Uh, and this is important. We measured our time to triage um, and frequency of the team having to drop SAST scans in favor of other tasks. So pretty much how popular was SAST within the team. The SAST popularity after a while increased, especially when we started automatically adding low noise results in Jira. And that gave us some security testing two and a bit. Three says we need to integrate security testing into the build and deploy process. So we didn't have that, but it because it wasn't in the in the process, it wasn't part of the build pipeline because that was very slow. It, and we were running it ourselves, but the results were much easier to gather. So let's say two and a half. Now, on the retro, it took us three to four months of non-release time to get Dracon where we wanted it to be. If we had started from SonarCube or something similar, and then we built or integrated on top of it, it would have been faster short term. Because building something that big that early was a bet that would have easily backfired. Luckily, the team is amazing and they made it happen. Uh, however, Dracon is open source now. You can find it on GitHub. It's under Thought Machine Dracon, and you can easily use it yourself without having to spend three months building it. But for us, any reprioritization on the business side could have killed the, pro the project and thrown away most of our time, which would not be great. It was a bet. However, Dracon was too efficient. And we started overloading teams with requests on fixing vulnerabilities. And 
then we realized that we needed some solid vulnerability management. So we started using OWASP Defect Dojo and adopted the process from uh, presented in Apps California. I've given a link to the slides. We copied it almost verbatim and then started heavily iterating over it. Installing Defect Dojo, which we used to manage our findings, took about a week, mostly because its Kubernetes manifests needed rework uh, to work with how we do things. And then it took another couple of weeks to experiment with Jira and figure out what data we want. And we measured slash retro when we didn't have any changes in the process for two weeks. And thus, we knew it was stable, so we wanted teams to start using it. What did we measure? We measured vulnerability staleness per team and per component, so how long vulnerabilities remained open, how often classes of vulnerabilities appeared per its team. Uh, we found several, several things that had root causes that were like systemic. And that gave us, I think, some defect management level one. And in our retro, we we found out that we spent too much time fine tuning for optional data. You do not need uh, which exact rule triggered which exact vulnerability. It doesn't matter. We spent too much time figuring who can do what on the vulnerability workflow. And in the end, it would have been better to start with small vulnerability tickets, like five fields, and go work on from there. Now, also Defect Dojo, despite the fact that it's an amazing project, it created two sources of truth, both Defect Dojo and Jira, which were very often inconsistent since we got lazy with syncing manually between Defect Dojo and Jira. But it has a great API for adding tools to it. So what did we improve? We improved the metadata gathered, added all the metadata, and we created a single source of vulnerability truth. In the end, we considered Defect Dojo not as important, and we said if it's not in Jira, it doesn't exist. Now, after that, we, we had a little bit of everything. We had a little bit of training, a little bit of automation, a little bit of pen testing, a little bit of vulnerability management. So we thought it would be good to do a bit on culture. It's not in OWASP SAM, but it helped us significantly. So essentially, we created a capture the flag team, a capture the flag club inside the company. We gathered monthly, uh, started doing uh, capture the flag uh, solved, capture the flag challenges that were close to the technology we had. And we also showed up in other teams' technical presentations in order to present security concepts relevant to the team. For example, if a team writes React, we presented how to hack React. Now, our CTFs was a monthly thing, as I said. So it wasn't a lot of consistent effort. It took us about a month to, to set it up and then measured after the second CTF and kept adding like positive or negative experiences as they should. Now, what did we measure? We measured participation, how many people are champions, not champions, senior, junior, stuff like that, and the security performance of individuals or teams that took the training. A good thing was that people were extremely likely to drag along other team members and we spent a ton of time working others through the challenge or hacking with them than working on it ourselves. It gave us opportunities to draw parallels with like past bugs and ways, and ways our products could fail. Now, on our retro, um, we figured out some of the custom CTF challenges we created took a lot of time. It would have been easier to work with solve challenges that others have started. And in the end, we moved to paid labs, but we should have done it way sooner. Maybe we should have started with paid labs, uh, something like 
secure flag uh, that OWASP members have for free or uh, hack the box or all sorts of other paid labs. However, the positives was that there was a couple of oh crap moments where engineers figured super serious vulnerabilities in the products they were building and they hadn't released yet, which was good. And we found several not serious vulnerabilities when we've realized bad behavior, things like, uh, you know, I, I forgot to use SSL between those two services or um, my my regular expression for uh, allow listing domains is slightly wrong, things like that. Then we wanted to, once we had all this, we wanted to increase our visibility and we in, we got inspired by uh, security knowledge frameworks, uh, Spring Questionnaire and um, ASVS. And we started automatically attaching general security questionnaires to feature epics for the product. What were the questions? Uh, these three, do you need security assistance? What can go wrong with your changes? And what have you done to, pre to prevent this? The last two is basic threat modeling questions. The first one was pretty much uh, help me. Uh, but I think that gives us uh, OWASP some security requirements too, and because we already had user stories and controls. And that was another super quick win. It took us an afternoon to find the correct phrasing and add it to Jira. Unfortunately, we measured way too late, pretty much never like after a, a year or six months and what did we measure we measured positive responses like how many people asked for how many times asked for people asked for help versus all the tickets that were left uh, to please i don't need any help and how many questionnaire tickets were closed early in the epic versus late in the epic how long it took us to respond and we also sent out the customer satisfaction survey for developers to fill uh, data and feedback showed that this was a terrible idea uh, most tickets did not require help and obviously security sensitive features relied on certain libraries and secure defaults so people felt that they knew what they were doing and most of the ones that did require help people pre preferred the immediacy of either instant messaging such as Slack or asking us via email since they could just add their teams as CC or other stakeholders. And by the time the feature had reached the implementation phase, which is Jira, the team was way too close to production to be stopped for any security retrofitting. So we had to rework this extensively and unfortunately we recorded very late. Um, so it had bad UX, it trained users to click, I know what I'm doing, which is the Windows pattern of just click OK on the error so you can do your job. And we also found out that most features we develop are not of a sensitive nature, which kind of makes sense. And instead, we moved to a similar questionnaire earlier in the feature cycle, and we learned that we should have measured earlier. Just to be clear, I've seen this working in other places. It's a great idea in general. It was just a bad, a bad implementation for this specific use case. So after that, or more likely at the same time as doing this, we felt that our training was not exactly up to spec or up to the level we wanted it. And we we got inspired by the Hack Shop with Zap training. So we started introducing a similar training on demand for everybody who wanted to take it. We adjusted our slides, uh, but we adjusted slides for to have parallels to our past vulnerabilities or at least equivalents, which gave us I think was some training level two and a bit. So 
to make this, it took us roughly two weeks of downtime to create it. And it was on demand, so not very frequent. And we measured the results pretty much after every instance of the training. What did we measure? We measured team performance, so vulnerabilities found per team, pre-training and post-training versus the points delivered. So how many vulnerabilities per feature, pretty much. And then a normal user satisfaction survey, what they think of the training. On our retro, we talked about the face-to-face -face training. And in the end, we sadly had to put it on hold because the company bought a corporate subscription to a training hub with much similar resources. So we created the times 10 times, and then we put it on, on the shelf. Not terrible, but and and it, the other the other solution is automated and we don't have to get involved. So that's great. After that, we felt that we're doing a lot of we're not offering a lot of company specific information on how to develop secure things. So we got inspired by SKF and OWASP cheat sheets, and we created the knowledge base, which initially was a copy of the content in both those projects. But with the help of security champions, we customized it extensively to our technology stack and the way we write software, which gave us OWASP some architecture level three. We had common design patterns, the security, security solutions for adoption. We standardized technologies and frameworks were standardized anyway, but we formally controlled the software design process and we validated utilization of secure components. With this knowledge base, it took us about a month to create it and make it somewhat useful. And then we measured about a quarter and a half later. What did we measure? We measured page views. That was on a wiki, uh, say Confluence. And wikis are really good for measuring page views. And we also created some opportunistic customer satisfaction uh, surveys, pretty much as people uh, if they if it's relevant to their technology stack and how can we make it more relevant and that's how this is how a lot of champions helped us uh, fix it on our retro we talked about uh, how we limited edits to the AppSec team and thus very few people read it in the end we integrated into the general company uh, knowledge base and after we had all that, we figured that we needed some more testing. So we improved the way we do tests uh, by adding them on a cadence, uh, doing both internal and external full scope pen tests on a cadence. And then we created a Jira alerts for specific features that we felt that were important. And we pen tested these specific things accordingly, which gave us some security testing level three. And here's where we were. Testing took us three quarters, pretty much one semester plus one major release. And we measured immediately after the second iteration. We measured normal things, uh, bugs found every test per team, bugs found externally versus internally. So external pen tests versus internal pen tests. Uh, time spent testing versus vulnerabilities found so we know how performant we are. And then customer satisfaction. Do we feel we did a good job? Do we feel uh, dev teams expected those issues? And what was the time to fix? How complicated were the vulnerability fixes? And other tickets delivered on months we were doing pen tests. Uh, we, in the retro, we also talked about how we did not consider helping external pen testers as much as we should have. So for example, we didn't give them uh, threat models at the beginning. And thus, they found fewer things than expected. 
However, with all this testing and all these vulnerabilities, we overwhelmed development teams again. So we had to improve our vulnerability management. So we started attaching SLAs to vulnerabilities. We started sending automated reports pretty much to everybody who either needed or wanted to get them. And plus an overview uh, vulnerability report from everybody. And we started asking for regression tests for every vulnerability logged as part of the remediation effort, which gave us defect management level two and requirement driven testing level two. We had, we had some of these already, but this extra bit um, solidified it, I think. Now, these alerts and dashboards um, took us about a month of downtime and and generally getting all the stakeholders in agreement of who should receive what. And we measured a quarter after that. It wasn't a fast feedback cycle, but at the level it was operating, things were a bit more slow. What did we measure? We measured how many vulnerabilities had SLA lapses, how many vulnerabilities had accepted risk due to tight SLA, so how many developers asked their director or their boss or somebody who could accept the risk to temporarily accept the risk in order to give them some more time to fix things. We ran a customer satisfaction survey and we measured our team effort on chasing vulnerability remediation. So how often in our daily log, let's say we, we had noted chasing X for X vulnerability. And also how often we missed triaged things as uh, yeah, how often we missed triaged things and we had to lower or in, like uh, increase the priority. In the retro, when the slide changes, in the retro, we figured that was a process driven by security. So because we knew what we thought we knew what we were doing, we communicated results and requirements, not why everything works or how things work. In the end, we spent way too much time chasing teams to fix vulnerabilities on time, but they didn't think the vulnerabilities were that important. And this was big time improved when we explained why the SLAs are what they are. As an extra, we assumed that team members would triage everything the same way. However, different people have different contexts and different opinions. And in the end, we had to create vulnerability triaging guides with examples and business use cases and context documentation so that everybody triages the same things the same way. In the end, here's where this got us. From secure build, we didn't do anything because we already had a badass build system which was really, really good and it's still really good. We improved our requirements driven testing by a little bit. We improved our security testing quite a lot. We created pretty much threat assessment and defect management. We improved our security architecture a little bit we improved our education and guidance a little bit and our security requirements plus our strategy and metrics after all we i think we followed mostly industry best practices but there were several cases where we went the extra mile and created new things such as dracon and other tooling for example in the end what takeaways i want I want you to get from this presentation. Application security is not the police. We, when we try to be the police and attach strict SLAs uh, for vulnerability management or not tell people why things work, we got very little engagement. Uh, however, when we started seeing uh, ourselves as the team doctor, uh, so more like prescribing a healthy and attainable like coding lifestyle we got a lot more engagement we got we found that by leveraging our build systems and we could do a lot more investigation and a lot more 
faster and easier detection of vulnerabilities. On the other side, we found that a lot of vendors have very long integration effort. Make, maybe long term, it makes sense, but at the beginning, you really, really need to move fast. So if you want something for next month, maybe it doesn't work. We also found that training and culture is important. We found almost as many vulnerabilities by training others to find them um, as we did ourselves with a tiny team. And as an extra, you never have unique problems. Ask someone else, and it is likely that people have the same problems as you. As a bonus, the security community is one of the most open ones, and our generic solutions were usually out there. We only had to create Dracon plus a few other like internal tools in our journey. We got, as you saw from the links, we got inspired big time by others because some security person somewhere else in the world had created the solution we wanted. And a little, a, for more takeaways, we almost never started from scratch. We got generic solutions in and then we iterated. We, we started embracing mistakes eventually and we backtracked quite a bit, which saved us time or allowed us to rework things significantly. One of the good things that the people who hired us uh, told us was measure everything. It doesn't have to be automated and uh, a retrospective meeting is sometimes enough and we embraced it and as you saw it worked quite a lot for us and fast feedback uh, is usually your friend we we didn't get feedback fast enough on one work stream and that was really bad for us and that's all i have for you thank you very much if you have any questions uh, please feel free to reach out I will, I will release those slides for everybody who wants them, and for I will also release the links. Uh, here are some extra shoutouts and resources uh, that the, that are really good for anybody interested in AppSec and AppSec programs. Uh, cloud checklist and cloud sec docs are great for cloud security things. Um, the newsletter TLDR sec in general and. Uh, this presentation from Clint Gilbert specifically. Uh, there is a lady called She Hacks Purple, and she has several AppSec write ups, which are really good content. And there are similar talks by a lot of others who give you a slightly different, but still very, very interesting perspective. And of course, uh, two more shout outs to the Go Jira and Go Confluence libraries, which helped us gather metrics and automate a lot of our work. Thank you very much.